Good morning. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm really, really delighted to welcome everybody here for an important conversation. Um, we have a very distinguished group of special guests uh, who you'll meet shortly, um, and we are here uh, today as part of a series of events that are happening this week um, here in Washington as a lead up uh, to Saturday, uh, which is Africa Day. And this is held each year to commemorate the founding of the Organization of Africa Unity on May 25th, 1963. So we're very pleased to be a part of that celebration. If you're tuning in online, you can join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag Africa Day USIP. Um, and I want to especially thank our fellow co-hosts who have made today possible the African Diplomatic Corps, many of whom are represented here today, um, and uh, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and we appreciate the partnership. Um, USIP was founded 35 years ago by Congress um, uh, as an institution that is federal, nonpartisan, uh, and independent, uh, dedicated to preventing and resolving violent conflict around the world. And we pull together research with training, with policy, and working in partnership with those who are on the front line of conflict, um, who are working to prevent conflict from becoming violent and resolving it when it does. And a lot of our work is in Africa, and that's why I was very pleased to see the theme of this year's uh, Africa Union, um, where you have on the continent, a significant refugee and displacement crisis, which is part of a global crisis of more than 68 million people who are forcibly displaced from their homes. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with these statistics, a combination of refugees and internally displaced. Um, but it's equal to the population of France uh, globally, 68.5 million people. And a third of those people are in Africa. Um, two of uh, the five countries that are most responsible, that are responsible for two-thirds of those refugees are, on, are in two African countries. Um, and Uganda is one of the top refugee receiving countries in the world. So Somalia and South Sudan are in the top five in U of, of uh, creating refugees and Uganda is in the top of receiving them. We're seeing that displacement is, is lasting longer, and it's forcing us to think differently about how do we address these crises and the roots of this crisis. That will be the focus of our conversation today, and that's why the African Union declared 2019 the year of refugees, internally displaced persons, and returnees. Um, so as I noted, we have a tremendous lineup today. Um, it's a great opportunity to dig into this topic, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker, Congresswoman Karen Bass. Uh, she serves as the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organizations. And um, I think I speak for all of us here at USIP and part of a much, much larger community we so value Congresswoman Bass's leadership in Congress on issues that are just core to our conversation this morning. Africa, migration, human rights, and peace building. Um, and in fact, uh, Chairwoman Bass's very first hearing this year was on a global crisis, refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers that really looked into the con uh, many of the core issues that we're talking about today. She's really at the forefront of thinking through how some of these uh, foreign policy issues need to be pursued. We want to give her a special welcome and thanks for changing her schedule to be with us here today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Chairwoman Bass. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is uh, certainly my pleasure to be here. I want to thank Nancy, the Institute, and the Wilson Center for sponsoring this event and inviting us all here today to speak about refugees and internally displaced persons in Africa. I also want to acknowledge the African Diplomatic Corps, and I'm honored to be here with you all today. Uh, I will uh, tell you that when I think of Africa Day, Africa Day was also celebrated in Los Angeles over the decades. I remember in the 70s and 80s, 
our focus of, on Africa Day during those years was supporting the various liberation struggles that were going on, and we took that day to acknowledge the growing independence movements. And so it is um, very exciting to me to be here today now as a member of Congress, something I would have never thought I would be <laughs> during those years. Uh, but I also serve in, in a capacity as, as chairing the Congressional Black Caucus and you should know that um, this year in the United States, we are commemorating the 400th anniversary that uh, Africans, enslaved Africans, arrived on the continent. And so there's a series of commemoration events that we're doing on the Hill in the state of Virginia. And then in August, uh, representatives of the Congressional Black Caucus, led by Speaker Pelosi, will go to Ghana to go back to some of the places where our ancestors left the continent to come here. So this is a very special occasion today and this year, and I definitely stand in solidarity with the African Union, focusing on the issue of displaced persons and uh, refugees for this year. So this discussion comes at a time when refugees and IDPs have become a critical international issue. Thousands of refugees that survived the journey to Europe has resulted, sadly, in populist groups using their plight to promote anti-immigrant uh, agendas. One thing that is, is not um, well known, except for by the ambassadors, I know, because they have to deal with this problem, but we have African refugees on our border of Mexico. Uh, as well, people who have come up through South America, talk about an incredible journey, South America, Central America, Mexico, and then wind up on the border uh, between the United States and Mexico. So when we're talking about this issue as it impacts the African continent, I know all of us recognize that this is an international issue impacting the world. When refugees, however, remain on the continent, their displacement in all regions typically goes unnoticed. Due to political conflicts, ethnic violence, and the increasingly amount of natural disasters on the continent, this has forced millions of people to flee their homes. Whether it is people being displaced due to violence in the, a nation or because of cyclones in Mozambique, lives are significantly affected. There are also the ongoing crises in South Sudan, CAR, Somalia, and Burundi, and many refugees migrating to Uganda, Sudan, Kenya, Ethiopia, and the DRC. The question of returning refugees and IDPs to their original homes, if not correctly managed, can provoke local conflicts over land and other resources and lead to a perpetual cycle of crisis and displacement. And as you are aware, in addition to IDPs, Conflicts in the regions have also produced millions of refugees. Some extremist groups have taken advantage of the unrestricted access to the territories of certain countries. Boko Haram comes to mind. Their insurgency caused 52,000 new displacements in Niger and another 22,000 in Cameroon. Kenya hosts the biggest refugee population in Dadaab and Kagama camp with more than half a million people. An entire generation of youth have become adults having only known life in a refugee camp. We must find solutions to Africa's refugee problem because the consequences of hosting a large number of refugees have been and will continue to be troubling for governments and the host communities. The sudden large entry of refugees puts new pressures on host countries that could further weaken the social, economic, and political conditions of the host communities. Furthermore, the refugees are competing for limited resources, which can ultimately cause tension and potential violence. For instance, Kenya has accepted an enormous economic, social, and environmental burden of hosting a large number of refugees over extended periods of time. Some of this burden has manifested into desperation in the refugees' camps, leading to violent extremism. It's critical that we find solutions for those citizens who want to return to their communities, to their countries, once the security situation or the conditions of a natural disaster have improved. This is where all stakeholders, including the US government, must help with aid assistance to ensure citizens living outside their country have safe passage and resources to return home and to contribute to their societies. That said, I always advocate for addressing the root causes that lead to citizens leaving their countries in the first place. I believe that good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, and the rule of law are critical. 
As all of you know, I always emphasize the need to increase investment and trade between U.S. and African countries. Jobs are another factor why people leave their countries, so we'll continue to push legislation that increases opportunities for U.S. business involvement. U.S. companies will not export a workforce of U.S. citizens to take jobs away from Africans. Finally, a lot can be said for political will. It is amazing what can happen when a leader and a government have the political will to address specific issues. With this in mind, I want to commend the African Union on the 10-year anniversary of the Kampala Convention. This was groundbreaking in reaffirming the rights of IDPs in the face of growing displacement problem in Africa. It is only legally binding document on internal displacement in the world. And Niger should be commended for becoming the first country to incorporate the convention into its legislation, voting to unanimously adopt a national law on internal displacement in December of last year. This legislation will go a long way in addressing displacements due to recurring conflicts and natural disasters, which can have an overwhelming impact on human life, peace, stability, security, and development. I want to thank you again for inviting me to take part in this critical conversation on refugees and IDPs in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I look forward to working collaboratively to help stop this ongoing crisis in the region and across the world. As always, I look to your help and your guidance and your suggestions for legislation and other advocacy efforts that we should have in Congress. So please uh, let us know your thoughts as we will continue to work on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairwoman Bass, uh, for a very comprehensive lay down and for your energy and focus on these issues. Um, and I'd like to now turn to Ambassador Saroush Fakir of Mauritius, um, who will provide a welcome on behalf of our partner, the African Diplomatic Corps. Uh, Ambassador uh, Fakir has a long and distinguished career in politics and uh, serves here as the Ambassador from Mauritius. Sir. Let us thank uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass for her insightful presentation. It's not every day we can have a Congresswoman among us. We also thank her for her presence among us and also fighting the African cause in Congress. Distinguished Acting Secretary, of population, refugees, and migration, Ms. Carol Thompson O'Connell, distinguished regional goodwill ambassador for the East and Horn of Africa, Gea Dwani, distinguished UNHCR regional representative, Matthew Reynolds, distinguished president of the USIP, Nancy Linbo, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of the African Diplomatic Corps in Washington, D.C., and as co-chair of the Organizing Committee of the Africa Day Celebration 2019, it is indeed an honor and a distinct privilege for me to welcome you all to this inaugural event. I seize this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to the President, Board of Directors, and his staff of USIP, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars for accepting to co-host this important gathering at this special venue. Thank you very much. The African Union Commission has declared 2019 as the year of refugees, internally displaced persons, and returnees. The theme intends to highlight the 50th commemoration of the abolition 
sorry, of the adoption of the 1969 OAU Convention governing specific aspects of refugee problems in Africa, commonly known as the Kampala Convention, as well as the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the 2009 AU Convention for the protection and assistance of internally displaced persons in Africa. We have present here a dynamic panel of eminent speakers who are well versed in the topic of our discussion. Indeed, the distinguished panelists will highlight African countries' policies, responses to displacement and discuss current and anticipated complex logistical and humanitarian challenges. It will also be an opportunity to brainstorm on innovative approaches to address crucial issues related to forced displacement and migration. I have no doubt that the conversation and the dialogue that will unfold shortly will indeed pave the way for deeper engagement and more concrete and sustainable actions to address the challenges of displacement and migration in all its forms. I wish you a very fruitful conversation and deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Fouquier. Um, and now I'm very pleased to introduce the Acting Assistant Secretary for, of the Bureau for Population, Refugees, and Migration of the State Department, Carol Thompson O'Connell. Um, she uh, has previously served uh, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, where she oversaw health issues, public diplomacy, and public affairs efforts, and Southern Africa affairs. And we really welcome you here for an opportunity to further frame the conversation. Please join me in uh, welcoming Assistant Secretary O'Connor. Good morning, everyone. It is a special pleasure for me to be here in celebration of Africa Day. I, too, want to thank all African ambassadors, the diplomatic corps, diaspora community and, and all protocol observed uh, for being here this morning to discuss displacement on the continent. I also want to thank the African Union for choosing 2019 to be the year of refugees, returnees, and, and eternally, internally displaced persons. And the subtext is towards durable solutions to forced displacement in Africa. Uh, and that's, a, that's a, a key part of what we do at PRM, which is durable solutions. I look forward to working together with all of you on this critical issue. The magnitude of displacement throughout Africa is staggering. Seven million refugees and over 17 million internally displaced persons having fled their homes due to conflict and persecution. The US government recognizes the scale of this crisis and we laud the immense generosity of African countries from national governments to local communities in hosting these displaced persons. We continue to seek longer term durable solutions for the displaced, including voluntary and safe returns whenever possible, local integration and resettlement to another location or a new country. Many countries in Africa now or in the past have both produced and hosted displaced people and the compassion and sense of responsibility to shelter vulnerable people who are fleeing violent conflict is remarkable. Even when resources are scarce, repeatedly, African countries and communities welcome their neighbors when they are forced to flee. Tanzania has hosted waves of refugees for decades with local integration and, in fact, naturalization of over 160,000 Burundi refugees over the course of the last decade, it is one of the most notable examples in history of a dignified, durable solution. 
Uganda, now host to the largest refugee population on the continent, has a long-standing model of allocating land to refugees, exemplifying that refugees and host communities can benefit from policies that promote self-reliance and social and economic integration. The United States is committed to its engagement in Africa. In the long term, both US and African interests are best served by stable nations with effective governments and growing economies. Protecting and assisting conflict victims and finding safe, durable solutions is a critical part of that success. The United States is the largest donor to humanitarian response in Africa and the world. In fiscal year 2018, the United States provided nearly $3.8 billion in humanitarian aid in Africa throughout the international and non-governmental organizations with over $1 billion coming from my bureau, the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration at the State Department, and $2.7 billion from USAID. These contributions are just a piece of the United States' enduring humanitarian commitment to the continent to protect refugees and crisis displaced people around the world, improve lives, and alleviate suffering. Our humanitarian assistance on the continent supports the work of many UN United Nations agencies, especially UNHCR, um, the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross, the International Organization for Migration, and many NGOs. We consistently also ask other countries to do the same, to do their part to support the work of these organizations in making sure that those in need have a place to live, food to eat, and hope for the future. Yet displacement continues and is on the rise, with an additional five million people displaced in the last two years. Like so many host countries, we too are frustrated by the persistence of conflicts and the many protracted displacement situations. Our support is intended to save lives, but increasingly we must find ways to reduce the burden on, 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 burden on donors and host countries by helping the displaced become self-reliant. We leverage our support to address protection needs and advance durable solutions. The US government has long recognized the increased prevalence and risk of gender-based violence, particularly targeted at women and girls, and particularly when disasters and conflict strike. PRM is a leader within the humanitarian community on the protection of women and girls. Each year, we provide significant funding to support prevention and response programs throughout the continent by working closely with our international organization and NGO partners to lead and participate in key initiatives focused on improving accountability, coordination, and innovation in the humanitarian community. Education, education for displaced children also remains a high priority for the US government. The United States is a leading advocate in ensuring humanitarian responses include access to quality education, as well as essential support services to ensure refugee children not only have the opportunity to attend, but also to excel in school and contribute to their communities. The United States supports education cannot wait. The first global movement and fund dedicated to education in emergencies and protracted crises. ECW has successfully brought together humanitarian and development stakeholders to produce multi-year programs to reposition education as a priority on the humanitarian agenda, usher in a more collaborative approach among actors on the ground, and foster additional funding to ensure that every crisis-affected child and young person is in school and learning. Also, we're pleased to see ECW provide essential support for protracted crises that are all too often forgotten, such as the situation in Chad. The United States has provided significant technical leadership and financial support to ECW since its inception. USAID provided technical input on fund architecture and results framework. 
and $1 million in financial support to stand up the fund's operations. Additionally, the USG contributed $20 million, $10 million from PRM and $10 million from USAID for initial country investments. We, we welcome initiatives that recognize the contributions that refugees can make, programs that encourage social and economic integration, enabling self-reliance, and coherence with development is a win-win-win for refugees, the countries and communities that host them, and the international community. We also welcome private sector engagement and innovation that has proven to increase service delivery and, and enhance dignity for the displaced. There are many examples from remote education programs that increase access to higher education, technology that enables efficient, sound registration, and mobile devices that facilitate communication with refugees and victims of conflict, which plays a key part in reuniting families separated during a crisis. Humanitarians and financial institutions have found common ground to bring much needed financial products like savings and loans and cash transfer capabilities to refugees. These partnerships have enhanced protection and dignity for refugees from South Africa to Egypt, who are increasingly living outside of refugee camps and re rely on cash to, to participate in economies and sustain themselves. At the same time, access to financial products has helped refugees in the most remote camps where once elusive access to capital has brought opportunity and self-reliance. Progress is underway to reduce the burden of protracted displacement. Ultimately, long-term durable solutions that transition refugees out of refugee status are the goal. Zambia, for example, recognized that many long-staying refugees could be better off in Zambia, and host communities could also benefit from their presence. The government is providing long-term residency, and in doing so, offering a win-win alternative to displacement and dependence. Similarly, as a part of the effort to find durable solutions for long-staying Senegalese refugees in Guinea-Bissau, the small country offered citizenship to some 7,000 refugees, while others opted, opted to repatriate and restart their lives in Senegal. We proudly supported these solutions and commend the leadership in these countries at the national and local levels. It takes all of us, the international community, national host country leadership, and local engagement to support efforts that help people displaced by conflict and persecution find livelihoods, education opportunities, and self-reliance so they can find their own durable solution, contribute to their host communities, and continue to live in dignity and with hope. Thank you very much for having me here this morning. Thank you, Assistant Secretary O'Connell. We really appreciate your giving that quite comprehensive uh, framing of the issues. And with that, I'd like to invite uh, our panelists to come up to the stage um, and take your seats. Um, we have a very distinguished group joining us. Um, Ambassador Wilson Masing Masinglingi uh, is uh, Tanzania's ambassador to the United States since um, August 2015. He's um, also been the ambassador to the Netherlands, served as a member of parliament, and a cabinet member in the president's office uh, responsible for good governance. Um, we have Ambassador uh, Katende uh, from the Republic, thank you. Ambassador Katende from the Republic of Uganda who has been here uh, since September 2017 and before coming to the U.S. he was the Ugandan ambassador to Ethiopia and Djibouti. Um, also served as the perm rep to Africa Union um, and the UN Economic Commission for Africa and the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, or EGAD. Ambassador Katende. We're very pleased to have with us um, Ambassador uh, Mukandabana, 
who is Rwanda's ambassador to the United States uh, and the non-resident ambassador to Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. Small little territory. Um, she was previously a professor uh, in Sacramento um, and is the co-founder co and president of Friends of Rwandan Association, which is a nonprofit American relief association uh, created in the wake of the genocide. So another round of applause. Um, Matt Reynolds is here with us. Uh, he's the UNHCR regional representative of the UN uh, Agency for the United States of America and Caribbean. Um, he has a very long and distinguished career with more than 30 years in government service, humanitarian response, oversight and management, um, and he's held his current role since June of 2017. And uh, uh, finally, we last but not least, and certainly not the shortest, we have uh, a very good friend, uh, and longtime colleague, Gare Duane, who was appointed the UNHCR Regional Goodwill Ambassador for the East and Horn of Africa in June 2015. And Gare will be able to ex share some of his personal experiences as a refugee from South Sudan. So, everybody for joining us. Um, we've had a wonderful uh, framing of the problem from our speakers so far. And I, I want to start with the big question of, you know, in the face of a rising crisis, there are more people who are displaced. They are displaced for longer. Uh, the causes are more complex that cr create the difficulty to go home. Um, there's been a lot of focus on changing how we provide assistance. This is not the old way of just providing food, shelter, water. We heard some of the durable solutions. Um, there was a, a new comprehensive uh, compact for refugees um, that was put together and agreed upon. And so I want to start, Matt, since you are the representative of our global body looking at refugees, um, what has that what has that compact done to change how we provide assistance? Sure, thank you. Um, well, the compact is new um, and very global, but we were actually able to start with a pilot in East Africa, which is our regional, um, uh, co regional compact um, uh, with eight different uh, countries in the region. And it's really looking at recognizing that you're absolutely right. The, the band-aid of humanitarian aid is very small on a very, very large wound, a wound that is growing and that is growing in protraction and size. So we need to find a way to find these more durable solutions. And it's more than just humanitarian, it's segueing into development as well. So the compact is really an opportunity for the global side, but looking at our regional compact is for the countries in, in, in Eastern Africa, but also countries around the world um, and other institutions to really help find these new solutions. Um, I would point out, for example, the relationship now with the World Bank. Um, here's an opportunity to look at both the short-term humanitarian and the longer-term development. Um, and through the IDA 18 uh, refugee sub-window, some $2 billion is now available um, in, in assistance for countries um, to address the long-term effects of forced displacement, both IDPs and refugees. Um, in, in the recognizing uh, that all, if you rise, if, if you will, if you rise the tides, all boats will rise with it. Um, so therefore, it's an opportunity for countries to have access to a lot of World Bank funding, not just for the host communities, but for the refugees as well. So it, it puts a nexus, if you will, or a, a togetherness of providing adequate protections and international protections for refugees, but at the same time, providing a real long-term development plan for the communities that are hosting them, uh, so that everyone together benefits from health, education, and so on. You know, even. When you're a poor country and you have a lot of more poor people come into your neighborhood, it's really difficult. So uh, you can open doors and, and um, uh, prosperity by accessing these things we just haven't really used before. You know, all of these programs exist, but they're in stovepipes. What the compact does is try and put them together, um, sort of put all the little Lego pieces together to make a nice big Lego instead of having the individual pieces all, all over the floor. Oh, I like the metaphor. Um, well, we happen to have some representatives of East Africa, 
And I'd love to, and we heard from our opening speakers about the Ugandan model. So I, I'd like to go first to Ambassador Katende. Um, can, what is the Ugandan model? How does it track with what Matt just said? And have you experienced some of this new World Bank funding uh, that enables both the host communities and the, and the refugees to benefit? Thank, thank you very much, and uh, happy Africa Day to all of us. Actually, what we call a Uganda model is an African model. In Africa, when people are in distress, they are brothers, they are sisters. You welcome them. What we have documented as the Ugandan model is where a refugee is given opportunity. It is perhaps one of the unique countries where you go to a refugee camp and you don't know that you are in a refugee camp. Because when people come in distress, first of all, there is this emergency assistance that must be given to them, food, shelter, water, medical care. But to sustain themselves, we give them plots of land so that they can generate their food. And that one has been uh, going on since the crisis in 1959. Secondly, we give them freedom. They can move anywhere in the country. And if they are lucky to get some jobs, they can go and do those jobs. Others go into enterprises. Some succeed. No Ugandan will meet someone and say, you, you are a refugee, don't do this. That's about our model. But most importantly, a refugee has a permanent home. When he has this situation, time does not stop. If he's a child, he has to go to school, if he's a mature person, he has to, to earn income and uh, meet obligations. We believe that it is important that refugees are given skills so that even after that situation, when they return home, they integrate easily. Briefly, that is the Uganda model. So, I mean, th this is significant because in many countries, of course, refugees do not have the right to work and their children do not have the right to go to school. Um, it, it, you said this was the African model. Uh, it, how broadly is that shared across the continent? Let me go uh, to Ambassador Masilingi because there was some, uh, I think Assistant Secretary O'Connell talked about some of the approaches that Tanzania has been taken, has taken. Thank you, Nancy, for having me. Greetings to everyone, to our Muslim brothers, Ramadan Karim, and a happy Africa Day. Yes, Madam Assistant Secretary Connell said it right. Tanzania started a long time ago. We, we are humbled to say that we have been uh, receiving refugees for many years. And uh, our policy has been uh, de facto open door. What uh, my brother, Ambassador Katende, has just described as the Ugandan model, the United said Africa model, is uh, clearly what we have been doing in Tanzania for many years. In fact, we resettled refugees into the country with an option to naturalize and become citizens. And those who opt to go back to their uh, countries of origin, they go back. And many of them have gone back, but we still have hosting about 300, 350,000 refugees as of now. But we have many settlements of refugees and the government has been taking care of them without even international community support. 
Why? Because through this uh, de facto open door policy, we allow refugees to own land, build houses, engage into business, take care of themselves, and therefore this saves the problem or the trouble of the government taking care of those refugees. And in Tanzania, we don't believe in this concept of refugees because it is foreign to us. If there weren't these artificial borders, we wouldn't have this thing called refugees. Why call a, a brother and a sister a refugee when he's moving away from trouble? And you are hosting him in order to save him, which is a moral duty, a humanitarian duty, which I would call upon everyone. Everyone in this room can become a refugee and internally displaced person one way or another as still as you are still alive. So what I would call upon to the global community is to advance the New York Declaration on this uh, comprehensive refugee uh, response framework so that we, we alleviate it to a legally binding inst uh, instrument like the Kampala Convention so that everybody is bound to uh, provide support to countries hosting refugees and also assist internally displaced persons to be able to take care of themselves, bridging the gap between humanitarian support and development needs. Thank you. And I, I want to go to Ambassador Mukatabana. You yourself were a refugee. Oh. Um, have, have you seen enormous changes since you were forced to flee your home? Does, are these does this represent a new way and a new approach? Thank you so much, Asi, and so wonderful to share the podium with my colleagues because they've said some of the things I could be saying. For Rwanda, it's a little bit of a different uh, board game because we're also a country providing refugees to other countries. Uh, as you know very well, in uh, 1994, we had a catastrophic genocide that killed a million people and sent more than three million people to exile. And we crowded their country, uh, DRC, and many countries. So what Rwanda has done, uh, number one, we have to say we are very open. We understand refugee status. Uh, I'm one of the, um, the people who benefited from um, getting support when I was a refugee. Uh, namely in Burundi first and then United States. All the opportunities that I was able to get was because I was in the United States and was able to go back. So my country knows firsthand what refugee status should be. And I echo what my friend was saying, the best thing will be that the ultimate is to remove any stamp of being a refugee because this is artificial. Uh, and it comes with the, the the liabilities that our continent suffers, you know, the artificial boundaries have also created that, along with that. And I'm not going to, to talk uh, at length, but we are also hopeful because as we, we move to do the integration of the continent, also the refugee status is, is going to be uh, mitigated in many different ways. So for Rwanda quickly, what I want to say is that for, for the last 25 years, uh, starting in 1990s, the biggest attempt has been to remove refugee studies from Rwanda, for Rwandans. So we have been able to repatriate three million people now. To Too bring many them home. Coming back home. You know, and all of us, you know, I'm talking about people who are coming from different countries in Africa, but also people from the United States, Canada, including myself, as I went back. So those were the policies that I don't know if we will have a chance to discuss, but Many different things were done. The most important one, maybe I can mention here what they call come and see, go and tell. Because our history was a violent history, to tell people to come back in a country that was soaked in blood, it took many programs from the country that has also allowed us to bring a whole sense of reconciliation that we can't talk about here. But we brought back those people is, uh, as we speak in a few minutes, I'm going to Indianapolis. It's the, the continuous journey to bring back people because they go and see and they, they are not now willing to, to go and contribute to the, the building of the country. We are trying to 
deal with the refugees coming from, you know, uh, there was a controversy when people from uh, 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 Libya were being denied the place and Rwanda said we are open, we are open. Even if the territory is still small, we have challenges, but there's no one who should be denied of the basic liberties of belonging somewhere. As a refugee, you are like a homeless person, even more than a homeless person, because even when you are covered with a house, uh, I can tell you for almost six years, I dreamt about a homeless. Because you, you don't belong to anywhere. Statelessness is the worst thing that you can give to any person. And, and for anyone who has been a refugee, even when you get the benefits of anything, doesn't really equate the fact of getting a country that can claim you as your own. You know, it's like being denied by your own country, by your own parents. Uh, you are thrown to the dogs. When you are lucky and you are able to, uh, to be afforded the refugee studies like in the United States, with also a graduated step of becoming a citizen, those are the best you can do to any person who doesn't have a home. Thank you. Thank you. And Gary, you, you were also yourself a refugee. Um, and of course, you know, providing durable solutions of settling uh, in your place of display, where you've been displaced to is one option, but the whole resettling to yet another country entails, of course, that's HCR's job also, but talk about your experience and how you see the, w where that experience needs to be improved. Well, first I'd like to thank you. You always create this opportunity where I find myself, you know, sharing my own personal experience. I remember a year ago, we have taken a long trip all the way to Dalai Lama. We spent a lot of time with him and to speak to him about the transformation. And today, here it is again, and then I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for you to invite me and be in your life like this, Nancy. And thank you to all ambassadors speaking about the transformation. We're talking about refugees, and when we're talking about refugees, we all can be refugees. I was a refugee at some point in my life. And, uh, and in order for me to be sitting here with you guys is because I'm given an opportunity somehow, somewhere, by somebody I don't even know. But today is my turn for me to speak about the refugees and my own personal experiences. But one thing that we always forget, it is that to transform life, is, uh, we, we need to talk about, or we need to address the, the governance and, and uh, and accountability, because that's where uh, the refugees' displacement start. And then instead of we engage about the refugees, they're not the problems. It has to be a problem somewhere uh, where the, the displacement has taken tolls in, in other countries. I've been, I, ha I had an opportunity to be in Uganda oh, more than one time, or any country in East Africa, to visit a lot of refugee camps, and those camps too, I resided there back in the 90s before I was resettled here to America because I've been here for over 25 years now. Um, the, but the fact that, you know, I was a refugee at some point is not leaving even though I had more than one citizen. And um, Uganda has good models. Uh, that model is actually helping the people of South Sudan who are being displaced there. But all these models, they need improvements uh, because um, when you're giving a plot to refugees for them to grow their own food and then um, the children go to school with the host community, you're actually helping the host community because they don't have job opportunity because the service is not given to them to by their own government to begin with. So an opportunity created by displacement of the South Sudanese and Somali, it become uh, another source of employment for the host community. So maybe these are where the resources should be mobilized and then uh, help the host community and the refugees to integrate themselves all, all together. So it's always a room for improvement, in my opinion. That is, is right. One thing which I didn't talk about is the challenge of the model. And the model has been challenged by the refugee flux from South Sudan because they came in large numbers. It Quickly. was difficult to accommodate all of them comfortably. Secondly, the environment. Wherever you have ma many people, the environment suffers. Thirdly, 
the protracted peace processes. Because it, uh, ultimately, you need to solve root causes. And these processes should be able to yield in a timely manner. Thank you. Yeah, and another thing that I'd like to add, uh, I know everybody would like to jump in at some point, especially speaking about the, the model that is being used in Uganda. Yes, it's good because it's better than nothing. Yeah, uh, But one thing about these refugees who are living in these places, they have brilliant minds. Internally displaced person, they have brilliant young people that are just, their skills are just fleeting, sitting in one place for so many years. If there's resources that are really going to help these models in Uganda, they should be focusing on how to extract those brilliant minds that are li living in refugee camps and IDPs, and, uh, and then they could really even educate themselves on how to really govern themselves and how to learn accountability. So it doesn't really have to be just the national, um, the host community, you know, try to teach refugees children, you know, who are having those facilities of learning. So the refugees too, they are educated in their own capacity and then that should be put to use. So, you know, traditionally um, funding education for refugees has been a little bit of an orphan and very difficult to raise money for that. And, and yet, I think what Gare said and what everybody probably strongly agrees is that uh, given the number of refu refugees and IDPs who are young, it is imperative. Matt, are, is the partnership with the World Bank starting to change that? Are you getting a different kind of resource that makes these kinds of priorities more feasible to pursue? Um, yes, and we are starting, but it's a, it's a slow and a small start. You know, unfortunately, and I really appreciate the program here today because the crisis in Africa, the refugee crisis, and remember, no one chooses to be a refugee. It's always your last resort, not your first option. Um, just doesn't get the attention that it needs. You know, I opened today's Washington Post. There's nothing about really about Africa. Um, and because there are so many protracted and growing crises around the world, um, it, it gets lost. And yet it's really important for people, particularly those of us here in the United States and in Western Europe and so on, to realize that you have very poor countries, whether it be in Africa, Asia, even in South America today, that are hosting all of these, uh, brilliantly hosting and, and um, all, of, all of these refugees. I think the important thing that we're looking at is that as uh, the flow of people becomes more protracted and longer. It is the importance to really invest in the health, in education, in the communities, because also remember that 58% of refugees do not live in camps. And even in, in many of the countries, whether it be Uganda or Tanzania and elsewhere, there are camps, but so many are within communities. So it's important to be investing in those communities, which is also investing in the country. So whether there are borders or not, um, uh, it's, it's there, but it is woefully underfunded, um, and I think a lot of that is just attention. We all have so many things in our lives that, we are, that we're, we're worried about, um, but I do think the attention that the things like Africa Day and this program bring are very, very important. You know, the United States remains our most generous uh, donor and is an extremely generous donor, um, but, you know, it's, 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 it still takes a lot of attention. Um, so I want to go into two other issues before we open to the audience for questions. Um, uh, the first is, of course, when we talk about 68 million people forced from their homes, 40 million of those are still within the borders of, the, of their country of origin and internally displaced. Uh, we heard from our opening speakers, they don't have the same legal protection globally that refugees do, but the Kampala Declaration signed 10 years ago was a really important step to um, provide some of those legal rights. How has that worked in reality? Um, and I want to, uh, Ambassador, yeah, Ambassador Masilingi. Thank you, Nancy. There, as we have just heard, internally displaced persons that are uh, forcibly moved out of their places of or habitually, uh, habitually, habitual residences or homes. It can be caused either by armed conflict or disaster or a major development project. So it all depends 
what caused the internal, internal displacement. So it's the duty is upon the government uh, and, the, and the development actors to take care of those internally displaced persons where they are because as the disaster continues, all the conflict is being resolved. Those people who are internally displaced need to live normal life. They cannot be left out while others are developing. So the support uh, we are getting from the International Community of the NHSCR and the great country, the United States of America, is really greatly appreciated, but we need to add more resources so that uh, the host countries or the places where these internal displaced persons are hosted are not displaced in terms of, uh, of resources, education, uh, water, health, uh, and the like, because uh, uh, social needs do not stop when we're in crisis. So continued support is, uh, is required. And, uh, global cooperation is uh, highly needed on that aspect. Thank you. It, since it's called the Kampala uh, Declaration, would you <laughs> maybe yeah, Ambassador the, Katende wants to comment. The unique thing about the Kampala Convention, it gives responsibilities to the states on what they should do. And uh, the primary responsibility is on the state concern. The region, the international community come in to support. Now for Uganda, we looked at every provision of this convention and adapted it to our situation. At that time, we had many displaced camps in northern Uganda because of LRA. And by working with the communities and uh, using this convention, right now all those people went back. The only two situations we have relate to disasters. And even there, we have relocated people with compensation, but it has also a challenge. People, Africans, love their ancestral areas. They, they just, you, 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 don't want, you don't remove them from where they, their grand grand are buried. So it is a problem. The second the second type is what is in a place called APA, which was a national park. And these displaced people from Konyewo occupied it. And they were from two different communities. And there have been clashes. But it has been resolved that all of them would be relocated and compensated. So one of the provisions in this convention is a, consp a, 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 a reparation mechanism. You, you compensate people who have been displaced. In Uganda, we are restocking many areas. Many people are helped to build houses. So that I, 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 if you go to Uganda, you'll be surprised. All those camps are normal. And, and I thought people can learn something out of it. We appreciate the support of the international community, no doubt. That is, will always be, be there. But the primary responsibility is on the state concern. Thank you. So, which leads to me to my final question before I go to the audience. And Gare referenced it, and you just referenced it, you know, uh, and that is the conflict that drives people out of their homes in the first place, the cause of this. And you know, when I began doing this kind of work more than 25 years ago, the primary cause of displacement was natural disaster, 80%, um, roughly speaking. Now, roughly speaking, 80% is caused by violent conflict. And a lot of these conflicts are conflicts that are happening within a country. Certainly that's the case for, for both of you in Rwanda and, and South Sudan. How, how is the Africa Union tackling that core causal issue? What should it be doing? 
What should we collectively be doing to try to prevent this displacement from happening in the first place? Well, I can just say a um, few things just about, especially my country, you know, a country that been engulfed by civil war now for over five to six years, who became possibly me, I think uh, we are third or second uh, country as a tiny country that lead uh, other countries uh, with the refugees globally. And that in itself is because we have in our internal uh, problems. So the internal problems is not is not longer our only problem, it become a problem of entire regions. And, uh, and I think the thing that people should be engaged about is uh, because everybody in the country, you know, is holding uh, some ideologies somehow uh, that I'm from this area and that I'm from, uh, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Catholic, and uh, I'm a Muslim. And, and also, you know, the government become very big in ideology and that divide the people within the country. And now our problem become the entire East African community country. And I can't thanks enough for welcoming our people, I open the door for them. But, uh, but the root cause of the problem is what need to be addressed so that the East African can have their own, uh, their own space, you know, where we don't really uh, take over their own homes. <coughs> So I'm always concerned about that. I don't think, um, I think South Sudan is still, is gonna be in a, it's in the beginning of a long journey uh, when we're talking about the conflict if it's not addressed properly. I think uh, you've mentioned that we need all the, the partnerships that we can get because at the end of the day, the best situation will be for refugees to go back home. <laughs> And there are many talks, uh, like for instance, in the case of Rwanda, uh, most of the refugees we have are from DRC, and uh, the latest one from Burundi. And I think a tri uh, tripartite dialogue that includes also many partners, including UNHCR, Rwanda, and then those countries, will be the idea to be able to see how we can work together to re resettle back the refugees. That's what we have tried to do for our refugees who are uh, abroad. Because at the end of the day, any situation without taking into consideration for a permanent situation, they always uh, come back to haunt the people. Because as you start, as, as we said before here, it starts because of a conflict, internal conflict. So the more refugees you have outside, and also the conflicts will continue because these people, you know, I lived in a foreign land for 30 years and I still wanted to go back home. So it means that at the end, at the end of the day is to start working on a situation where people can go back home if possible. The ones who are staying in the country to get a permanent citizenship because no matter how much we can address their issues, no matter how much we can say, oh, uh, we can give them resources, but when you don't have a state, you don't have a state. You are a displaced person no matter what. So I thank you very much. Thank you. I want to open it up and we have, uh, are we, we, we've got mics. Are you going to pass it? Yes. So raise your hand and we'll pass the mic and let's go right there because you are handy. Yes. And then you can, the, the woman ahead of you after. Um, go ahead. Yes. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Bradley with IDS. Um, I'd like to thank you for your comments, and I wanted to know if you could maybe address the private sector and corporates and what the role is that they might be able to play in supporting refugees, whether in IDPs, whether it's with vocational training, access to capital for entrepreneurship, and ways that they can be engaged in a meaningful way in this process without being exploitative. Okay, we're gonna take a couple questions, so take note of that one, thank you. And the woman in orange right there, did you have a question? Did you have a question? No? No. Okay, um, this gentleman right there. Uh, there you go, Jude, thanks. All right, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, my question will go to the Ugandan ambassador. I'm South Sudanese human rights activist. My question to him is, isn't the Uganda part of the problem that causing a robbery from African countries? Because Uganda involved into several wars. Somalia war, Uganda is a part, 
in Berlin too, causing a rubbery, Congo war, causing a rubbery, a car war, causing a rubbery, and South Sudan. Uganda, Uganda in Berlin to all of those problems. You are talking about model, but you are the part of the problem that causing Africa to be displaced. Isn't it you? Okay. Uh, we're going to take one more, right down here, front and center. Yes, in the blue. In the blue, in the blue. Over here, in the blue, right in the middle. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm the ambassador of Niger, and I would like to make some comments and some observations. First of all, your panel, they are all from East Africa or Great Lakes region, but I think uh, to have a more a broader view of the problem and to have to share our perspective. I'm from West Africa, and we are dealing with this very difficult situation of Boko Haram, the basin of Lake Chad, and in Mali, in uh, 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 the Mali Republic, and we have both IDPs and uh, refugees. So I think it's very important to hear from uh, this region uh, to know what's going on and how we deal, how we manage these two aspects, the IDPs and um, First of all, I think uh, it's very important, it's very important uh, to put an end to the ongoing conflicts. You cannot, you cannot solve the problem without peace and security. Why you don't have IDPs and refugees in the United States? Because of peace and security. <laughs> because of the day Africa will be a peaceful continent with no war, with no terrorists, with no crisis, and then you don't, we will not have any IDPs or refugees. So it's very important, this part of that. Secondly, I think it's very important from the African perspective, the AU perspective, you know, prevention, mediation is key. Because you see uh, now, uh, uh, let me just give you an example. In Gambia, uh, in the aftermath of the elections, the presidential election, when the former president uh, refused to step down, the mediation of the African Union and the ECOWAS, the regional bodies in, Africa, in West Africa, uh, the problem was peaceful resolved. And I think this is uh, uh, the way to go to have uh, African solutions for African problems. And uh, not only dealing in the Security Council decisions taken by the P5, no, African Union should be consulted when it comes to deal with these very important issues. So in the interest of time, I will be very brief and make it short. But uh, I mean, for the next session, uh, I think uh, we should be consulted on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for bringing the West African perspective to the panel. We had this, we had this internal conversation. We clearly need a second chapter to do that. And thank you also for uh, emphasizing the important uh, the importance of getting at the root causes. And I asked about, con uh, about how we might do that, but not framed in terms of what is the African Union Peace and Security Committee doing. So let, let's bring that back to our panelists, as well as the role of the corporate sector. And Ambassador Katende, I leave it up to you if you want to respond to the second questioner. So, uh, Matt, you want to start, and then we'll jump in real quick with the with the private sector because it is a very important part of the compact. We th often think about states and 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 governments involvement, but actually the real promise out there is the entrepreneurial and the private sector. And it's not just what you think about, which is a big corporation coming in and helping. It's actually developing national economies. One of the things the International Finance Corporation, part of the World Bank, has been doing in countries like um, Kenya is working with refugees and local Kenyan businesses to develop um, in those communities. And those businesses become the national corporations that hire, as opposed to a large international. That's always helpful. And you know, I would be remiss not to speak out for all of the things like the IKEA Foundation and others that are very, very helpful in bringing investment and, and things. But I think really investing in the, in the host country, developing those skills, because again, that refugee or that internally displaced individual will go home at some point, will want to go home, and will bring that there. Um, and to the ambassador from Niger, I would just point out, um, for 
UNHCR, we're, all, we're, we're everywhere. I wish I didn't have as many friends as I did because that would mean that there are more conflicts resolved. Um, unfortunately, I, we seem to make more friends and open more offices, but um, we certainly appreciate and Niger plays a very important role in the Sahel, um, particularly with um, uh, 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 transfer facilities as well. So thank you. Ambassador Masilingi. Thank you, Nasa. Quickly, first point, with regard to the role of the private sector in supporting the refugees, this is a good idea. The, the challenge is the private sector always goes for profit. They want to make money. And the refugees have no purchasing power and credibility even to take loans and to be able to engage in a business. But I would encourage the private sector to support the refugees because they are potentials, they are intelligent. Most of them are educated, and those who are not educated are entrepreneurs, and they can do business and make people prosper. Tanzania's experience is, 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 is that we have benefited in resettling refugees and allowing them to, uh, to do business, to do farming, and they're contributing to the economic growth of our country. With regard to the solution of uh, solving the source of this problem, promotion of freedom, democracy, respect of human rights, to stop violating people's human rights, and to also to make sure that our governments, uh, our countries are properly governed and not cause peace and insecurity to the citizens. This will solve the problem once and for all. But uh, for the time being, we should commend ourselves and our current leaders. The Kampala Convention is a good example. Uh, unfortunately, only 27 countries, if I'm not mistaken, have ratified the convention out of 54. And uh, since we want to move it global, I think uh, many countries that haven't signed the Kampala Convention, I would invite them to sign and ratify. And then the United Nations should do emulate the African Union initiative so that we globalize this comprehensive uh, uh, refugee reform uh, framework that will legally bind all parties to the, uh, to the convention to support internet displaced persons and refugees as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the friend from South Sudan, uh, I want to inform you that uh, the conflict in South Sudan is one of the most documented conflicts because the parties have gone through peace processes, even signed agreements. Reports have been prepared, and nowhere do you find that one of the causes of your conflict is Uganda. Nowhere. <laughs> and that is the evidence that he, there is. Secondly, on the issue raised by the ambassador of Niger, thank you, because you bring in a very important element, I'll just respond to one element relating to terrorism. Refugees are a vulnerable lot. These main terrorist groups are required ISIS and their branches, Boko Haram. They are looking for vulnerability. So if they find these refugees there, they will infiltrate them, they will infiltrate them, and then you have terrorism heightened. The international community has to work with Africa. I think we are not doing enough with regard to what is happening in Sahel. There are many, many, many things going on, and they are multiplying. We really have to, because terrorism is here, is everywhere. We have to work on it. Thank you. Well, I commend everybody to take a look at the task force on uh, countering violent extremism by looking at its roots in fragile states. It's on our website. It's a very esteemed uh, task force that made some recommendations. We're going to do another lightning round. Uh, this woman right here, why don't you stand up because Jude can see who I'm talking about. And then uh, the woman right in the middle there who's waving her hand. You, we'll go next. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you all for this wonderful exposure of the, uh, this nagging problem. 
I was born in Kenya, so I have a personal interest in this. I'm going to ask uh, you to be succinct because we're running out of time. Yes. What I want to mention uh, to the panelists, and because we have representatives of uh, major key players, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, a personal uh, attachment to these countries. What is the, um, this uh, association doing? I would call it association now because we don't have a specific uh, kind of international umbrella group. What uh, our yielding members are accountable to uh, solve these issues? Kenya has had, uh, an issue of IDP, which to my understanding, United Nations does not directly support because they, they say that belongs to the state. So how are the member countries empowering one another, holding each other accountable to give lasting solutions? Because as uh, Ambassador Katenda has mentioned, the uh, terrorist group will, uh, will target these places, their camps, because of their vulnerable people, disgruntled, unsettled, and exploit the situation. So are we, how are we holding members accountable and empowering each other to solve the problem? Thank you. Thank you, and go ahead. Thank Thank you. Um, my name is Melisa, and uh, thank you for the ambassadors to be present here. Um, I am from the Congo, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, it's a country where, as the ambassador have mentioned, we have uh, also refugees coming from the South Sudan and in the East, Tanzania, Uganda, and also they're going out into Uganda. I have family member in Kampala. Recently, I have cousins who have just been placed in the United States coming from Kampala. And my question is really um, in regard to multinational corporation. Um, the young lady asked about um, the um, involvement of private sectors, but what is the uh, United States or uh, international organization doing in, rela in relation to multinational corporation involvement in the displacement? Because we're looking at the root cause, and I believe that they are a major part in that because they're able to, uh, especially from where I'm from, the mining regions in the eastern region um, close to Rwanda, they're able to bribe um, the um, people coming in to like displace internally and forcing people out of the, the country. So the role of the private sector not as the not solution as but as the but cause. cause. Correct. Um, okay, so this will, I'm gonna ask the panelists uh, to respond to those, either of those two questions and make whatever final points you'd like to make. We'll do a closing round. Um, so we'll just go straight down the line. Thank you, Nancy. With the, regard to how are we empowering each other to assist other in uh, responding to these problems, in East Africa, I'm responding to the question from my sister from Kenya. She said she was born from Kenya. She was born from. She was born in Africa. I think she's American now. <laughs> so my sister from, was born in Kenya. In East Africa, through the spirit of integration, we are working together very closely, uh, and uh, we are almost advanced to doing away with these problems being solved by a single country. We, we, we are cooperating very closely from South Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and Tanzania. So we cooperate and we support each other, but uh, uh, international community support is, is welcome as well. <coughs> Multinational uh, cooperation is role in this is a good idea. I support it. UNHCR, a gentleman can uh, uh, appropriately respond to that one, but uh, uh, I, I support the idea of multilateral cooperation in supporting the initiatives of host countries in the way they respond to this crisis of refugees and interna internally displaced persons, because host countries by themselves cannot do. This is a human issue. So according to uh, moral response to this problem is the duty of everyone in this, country, in this world. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you. On uh, accountability, one of the new things in the Kampala Convention are provisions on accountability. According to the Convention, AU member states are supposed to include in their reports to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights elements to do with IDPs. 
two, we have a mechanism called APRM, African Peer Review Mechanism, where countries peer themselves, evaluate themselves, and are helped by others to learn from good experiences. That mechanism also, they are compelled to report on IDPs in their countries under the APRM. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think they have addressed some of the, the questions. Uh, maybe I could just conclude by saying you can't do it alone uh, in terms of refugee situation. It's an effort by everyone, and that has a dose of compassion for people. You can't just do it like business as usual. These are human beings. So uh, what I can say is that, uh, like what my colleague ambassador was saying in our region, I think we are working together, but also within the AU, African Union. And uh, more importantly, maybe uh, something else I can add uh, when you are talking about that. It's not one solution for anything, for anything. Like for instance, uh, there are times when countries, small countries, like my country is the size of Maryland, and we had an influx of 150,000 refugees. It's already a big population. But working with different mechanisms, for instance, there was, uh, when we agreed with the partners, like the United States, we resettled 1,000 people who came here last year. We had other people who became citizens, and we had other people who are still in refugee camps. So, and with the ultimate goal of also being able to give them economic leverage, that's why private sector, especially in this case, NGOs that work in the country are key to making it a success, you know, for them to be integrated within the financial system and be able to do cooperatives and so on and so forth. So I thank you again. This was quite an enlightening uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Um, very quickly, first with the IDPs and refugees and, and so on, I would point out, and sadly, very sadly, particularly in the case of Africa, the needs clearly outstrip the resources that are available for us to help. Just to put it in perspective for a moment, we have 25 million uh, persons of concern that UNHCR is concerned about in, in the region. That's the entire population of Australia. Okay? or Texas or Florida, um, or the entire metro area of LA and Boston combined. So you know, that's a lot to be responsible for. So I, I know that the, uh, many would like more assistance, would love to give more assistance. It's just the needs do outstrip um, uh, the, the, the resources that we have, despite the generosity of many, private sector, governments um, um, as well. Uh, secondly, I think um, uh, from uh, the, uh, the lady from, uh, from the Congo pointed out really the complexity here. Look at DRC. It is, it is a country of origin, it is a country of transit, and it is a country of safety. So that in and of itself shows across the board with all the countries here um, the complexity. And so because of that, um, there aren't really, unfortunately, oftentimes simple solutions. Um, I would like to just close maybe by, by thanking everyone, thanking the host countries. For UNHCR, we can't do the work without the support of the host governments. These African governments are incredibly generous and helpful. And of course, to donors, whether they're private citizens here in the United States, the United States government, and, and hundreds of, of countries around the world. Um, we're, thank you. Gare, bring it home. Okay, home it is. <laughs> no, I'd just like to thank you, actually, you know, and uh, this kind of discussion are really important. And when you see as we sit here on this panel, it's not that we all have the answers or that, you know, your involvement in this conversation is really important. As you sit there, you might be having the right answers. So the young lady that was speaking over there about this, the, um, the, the sponsorships, I think it's a very important program because uh, I had an opportunity three years ago where I went to uh, Congress and then uh, I was presented it uh, to the Congress men and women as uh, one of the refugees that have a successful story. And me and another guy was a Marine from Boston and he came, we came about the same times. And then that was the longest that I ever sit in one place for like three, four, five hours. And then, and then, the, <laughs> and then we talked about the programs and, and how to bring like 110,000 refugees here. 
So those refugees, they've been in a pipeline in order for them to be resettled here to America and other countries. But um, because the new administration has come in and then those programs has been cut off. So when we're talking about the models of uh, bringing refugees into this part of the world, it's really important if private sectors and faith bases uh, can match the effort of the refugees that is being cut off and then they can raise money to really support a family of the refugees for over a year and then integrate them because integration is not really an easy thing. I'm still trying to integrate myself over two decades now and we have four presidents in the United States and that I voted in. So you can't even imagine uh, having a refugees coming here or just spending their time in refugee camps and then never come here and never have an opportunity in East Africa. These are the things that uh, can be improved. A program to really help a refugees wherever they are would be very intelligent. No one wants to leave their own home. I never want to leave my mom and my dad and be away for past 18 years to 25 years now. And, and, and later, by the time I went back, you know, my folks are getting older. My mom died, and then I'm, I'm no longer having a mother. So I, I don't really want that for another kids in, in East Africa. If these models can be improved, and then, yeah, refugees can be... We don't have to cut that program that brought us here completely, but we can improve it, even uh, set up educational, uh, vocational schools for people to educate themselves and remain in their area, and they don't have to come here. And the few that we brought here, fine. So. We don't find ourselves sometimes here. Yeah, it's not easy. Thank you, Gare. Um, and congratulations to Gare and his new baby. Um, <laughs> I want to I, I wanna that, thank That our, was a secret between me oh, and you. <laughs> I want to I wanna thank our panelists for helping us to dig into, you know, really the, the scope, the size, the complexity, the causes of what has seized the African Union. Um, as its theme for this year in terms of managing forced displacement. This is obviously a topic that will continue to occupy uh, many of us, I hope. Um, thanks to each of you for joining us today, for being a part of this conversation. Thank you to our Sahel panelist, the ambassador from Niger, who brought an important perspective from that part of the continent as well. Um, happy Africa Day to everybody. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you.